right, good evening everyone. We will call this meeting to order. Um, thank you for attending February, t um, t says February 10th. I'm going backwards in time. Um, to today's the 24th, Mar uh, February, March 21th. No, February 24th, we got it down. But it's the old agenda because we um, had a snow day, like everyone else. So, um, call the meeting to order and please join me in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you for attending. As you can see, I am not the mayor. Uh, the mayor was invited by the governor, most of you may have read it in the paper, to join a uh, very serious and important issue in the state, the Opiate Task Force. Um, it's really an honor for um, our mayor to be invited to this. He's the only mayor on the task force and really um, representing the South Shore, uh, the southern portion of the state. So uh, as we all know, uh, Mayor Carpenter uh, has a very um, personal uh, relationship with respect to this issue. He um, was instrumental uh, in assisting us to have the um, recovery of high school, so he certainly is a good choice. He may be on his way here. I got a text from him that he's in bumper to bumper traffic uh, on the expressway, so we'll see how long I am in the big chair tonight. So, um, the next item is hearing of visitors. Ms. Alves, do we have any visitors that would like to speak tonight? No? Okay. All right. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is made up of some of the routine business of the school committee, and we uh, basically will remove certain items if members of the committee would like to comment and address certain issues. So we have uh, items A through J. Would anyone like to remove any of the items listed? No? Okay. I'll move, or I will remove a couple. Um, item D, item E, item F, because we see our friends from the Pliff School here, so I certainly wouldn't want them to go home without uh, being called on the carpet for a couple questions. Um, other than that, um, can I have a motion to approve A, B, C, F, I'm sorry, not F, G, H, I, and J. So moved. All right, any comment? No, nope. all in favor? Great, okay. Item D, I always like to point out the generosity of people that um, donate to the schools. Item D is the approval of the Frederick and Sandra Stanton Scholarship. Uh, the attached $500 scholarship has been established in the name of Frederick M. and Sandra C. Stanton to be awarded annually. Frederick Stanton was a teacher in the Brockton Public Schools and served on the Brockton School Committee for eight years. Mrs. Stanton worked in various nonprofit organizations associated with the city as well as an active member in Brockton politics. So we certainly appreciate the Stanton family for being so generous. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, a motion to approve? So moved. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Great. Okay. The next one is very, um, is very interesting. It's uh, the Class of 1960 Anniversary Scholarship, a one-time award. Members of the Class of 1960 have offered the attached one-time scholarship award in the amount of $5,000 to, to commemorate the 55th anniversary of the class graduation. So that is very generous and um, needs to be noted. Um, Motion to approve that generous scholarship. Any further discussion on it? Okay, all in favor? Great, okay. And I'd like to invite our friends from the Pliff down. Um, approval with respect to the Pliff School Washington DC field trip. There is an amendment request to increase the number of students, but I also see that there is a um, an additional number of chaperones that the Pliff School is recommending uh, accompany the students on the trip. So, how are you? 
Always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. My pleasure as well. So you have increased uh, interest in the trip? We have, absolutely. Okay. 93 students? 93 students. 93. Up with from the 70? 70, 70, right. 70. Um, and with the 70, what was it going to be? Seven chaperones? That's right. correct. And with now, one nurse. With, the, with a nurse. An additional nurse. That's right. great. And then now you want to go up to nine? Nine chaperones. With, again, a nurse. with a nurse. So that's 10 people? Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's excellent. With okay. two administrators going and um, seven right. staff. Yeah, it's, it'll be fun. And once again, you will not be attending? I will not be attending. No. Yes. We it's it's the bus ride. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we know. But uh, the, the students will be in good hands, I'm sure. They'll be in excellent hands. <laughs> so um, does anyone on the committee have any questions? Mrs. Joyce never lets us down. So, Mrs. Joyce. I just have a question. Does this have any implications on the hotel they're staying at? Or I assume you're going to have an additional bus, uh, but are you able to stay at the designated hotel that was first selected? Yes, they were able to accommodate all 93 students. Okay. Um, in the bus, we were able to bump up to just two bigger buses, so we're still only taking two buses down. Okay, great. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So you decided to go to um, D.C. rather than New York City. Um, do you think it's a, 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 a better experience or more educational items to see, or what's your reasoning on that? I think the group of eighth graders we have this year were given the opportunity to go to New York City last year as seventh graders, but they hadn't the opportunity to go to D.C. the year before. So we want to give every group of children the opportunity to go to D.C. once and another location the next year. So, Great. so every other year it will be D.C. Hopefully. Okay. Because it's such an amazing city. Mm. It, it's great, and, and so much of that is free. Exactly. Term, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of D.C. Exactly. It's a very affordable, when you get there, vacation because you don't have to pay tickets for most for ninety percent of the items so it's great so excellent trip um, I will have to tell you that my uh, daughter went to school at American University in DC and now works for the National Air Traffic Controllers and I was mentioning you know the group going and she said well I'd love to have them come up to one of the towers and I mentioned the hundred so it was a no-go <laughs> <laughs> excuse me okay so and how about free airfare I don't know if, if she could work on that. If we can't, if we can't get a tour of the uh, <laughs> tower, yeah, really, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, okay. Um, great trip. No other comments or questions, M Mrs. Sullivan. I just think it's great that 23 more students will be able to take advantage of such a great trip. We didn't want to say thank no you to anyone, and right. so thank you for your willingness to approve more numbers, higher okay. numbers. Thank you. changes to the plan as originally presented? Second. Seeing none, all in favor? Wonderful. Have a wonderful trip. Thank you. Hopefully Thank you. there won't be snow. <laughs> but By June, no. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. That will be one. Sure. Will we see pictures again? Absolutely. Postcards? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, communication, Superintendent Smith, report of the Superintendent of Schools. Um, can I make a comment under communication? Um, we did receive uh, a CC, the mayor and myself, a letter from Carl uh, Evan Yancey's mom. And it was a beautiful letter. Uh, it talked about um, thanking the guarded school and the staff uh, for certainly supporting them in their time of need, but also talking about what it meant in his life. Uh, granted, he wasn't with us a very long time, a few years. Uh, just, just a wonderful letter that we will share with you uh, in your packet. Um, I'm losing track of time. I'm not sure if we gave it to you. I think you got it last Friday. So I do want to uh, thank her for those comments. Uh, certainly much appreciated. And we certainly will continue to, to support the family. Carl Yancey was a wonderful person. <clears throat> Whenever anyone was around Carl, he made you feel good. He made you feel happy. He, um, you know, you'd see him at Shaw's, and he was just the type of person that, uh, you know, would strike up a conversation with anyone. And when you left, you always had a smile on your face. That's the type of person he he was, and he's obviously greatly missed. So, 
So report of the superintendent of schools. Uh, I'd like to start before I actually go into my report and tonight we're going to have uh, a presentation by Marquise Taylor who has been working with the Brockton Public Schools for a number of years and I will say when you talk about college and career, when you talk about a district as large as ours with the needs that we have, this is one of those programs, and Marquise is a graduate nearby of Stonehill College. Um, I think he grew up in the state of Connecticut, is that correct? California, California. oh my goodness. And you know he has uh, worked very closely with us to provide mentoring, to provide all of those things that can make a difference in a child's life, that can make them take a look at their grades, take a look at their behavior, take a look at you know where they're headed. So I'd like him to come and really explain the mission of the program. I will tell you we're actively working with our Marquise, like in so many other areas, to find additional funding. We're talking about connecting with the Chamber of Commerce, talking about talking to some of our businesses, and how they can sponsor and show real results as to how it makes a difference in, in a number of our students' lives. So Marquise, could you please join us? Do we need to move? He's doing a PowerPoint. Okay. Thanks for having me. So I've never been to a school committee meeting. Do I just jump in or how does this, how does it work? All right. Um, so as, um, Kathy Smith said, my name is Marquis Taylor. I'm originally from South Central Los Angeles. Um, I started Coaching for Change back in 2011 upon graduating with my master's in teaching from Smith College. Um, what really prompted me to start uh, the organization was back in 2011, I think I read a research article that said kids are dropping out of school um, every 11 seconds. And it changed my viewpoint of education and growing up, I never was a kid that enjoyed school or was a part of the school atmosphere. I, I was a kid that was rebellious but was able to stick with it because of sports. Um, so when designing the program, it was originally thought of um, as just a job training program. But as we grew, um, we started out of the Boys and Girls Club of Brockton with 10 students, it grew to about 22. And during the course of the program, I started having the kids bring in their report cards. And I started seeing how they were improving academically. And that's when I made the decision to transition to, instead of partnering with the Boys and Girls Club, to partner with the school district to actually see how we're affecting their grades and what's happening within the school day. So in the spring of 2013, we partnered with Southeastern Regional High School. Um, we worked with 100 high school students, and we saw that their behavioral, behavioral infractions reduced 100%, and 56% of our high school students, their grades increased. Um, and we have a 100% graduation rate. We wanted to replicate what we did there in the Brockton Public School System. So in the spring of 2014, we partnered with Brockton High School to develop a program um, or replicate the program and add more. Uh, so here's our, our project overview and our mission and, and pro, uh, project goals. It's really to provide an opportunity for young people to experience true support and leadership all at one time. We believe that giving kids an opportunity to see what comes next is very important. And I think that what's allowed us to get a lot of traction um, nationally is we have a tiered mentoring program where college students are working with high school students and they turn around and work with elementary and middle school students. Um, so one of the things we noticed in Brockton, not only Brockton, but a lot of low income communities is that young people need extended learning opportunities. And a lot of times, we talk at kids and they know all the right answers, but we need to provide opportunities for them to actually explore their own leadership skills and how to, en and how to engage within the school district, within the school, within just a learning environment. Um, so I know this is the target middle school population. Through our program, we've, had, we've created two different programs, which we'll go into later, but our target population are students 
that are struggling with school attendance, school behavior, and course, course performance. So our elementary and middle school program, we create an after school sports um, club and academic enrichment that meets two times a week um, for eight weeks from 2, 2.45 to 5. For the first hour, they're getting academic enrichment, which is split into three groups. One is homework help, another is academic board games, and the third is a literacy club. For that second hour, they're playing in a sports league, whether it's a basketball um, club or basketball league within their school or a flag football league. That, that's how our, our, the program is set up. Um, and it's all run by our high school and college students. So the, our, our sports apprenticeship program is where we recruit college students to implement and co-facilitate our program uh, where they're teaching literacy skills and also leadership skills to the high school students that we've identified. They build relationships through coaching and learning these different tactics and they run the after school program for elementary and middle school students. Our high school students also get academic support from our college students. And the one element that's really different is that they get the opportunity to go to, to a college field trip three times during the semester. During that semester, they are visiting the college campus, they're sitting in on classes and meeting college professors all with the goal that they're going to graduate on time from high school. So currently within Brockton Public Schools, we don't have the data because we're still working with um, the administration to see how we are actually impacting um, young people because we've only been in the program or this semester just ended and we're still trying to figure out how it all works and learning the system and building out that partnership with Brockton Public Schools. But here are, the, here are our partner sites here from elementary, middle school, college, and high school partners. And I'm currently um, teaching a course at Stono College, which is an entry point for some of our college mentors. And we'll be doing the same thing at Bridgewater State um, next, next school year. So for the, we were currently we're running three programs um, here in Brockton and two of them have been funded by the Plymouth County DA's office, um, which has allowed us to really work with, I think it's currently 50, 52 high school students who are turning around working with 300 um, elementary and middle school students um, at, at, at our partner sites. And so I just wanted to thank you guys again for the opportunity to present today because I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm learning um, more and more the kids need an opportunity to lead and oftentimes we when we present opportunities to young people that we don't believe or think that they can achieve sometimes they actually do rise to the occasion um, one of the stories that I like to tell you guys about is a student that we've been working with for the past three semesters he entered um, at a young age, he went into the foster care system. And he was bounced around between Boston, uh, New Bedford, and he's ended up in Brockton. And while he's at high school, he's going to school here, and he, he, wanted to, he wanted to find a way to fit in, but he always found himself getting in trouble. And a lot of people wrote him off because they gave him chance after chance after chance. But we were able to get him into our program and actually provide him with college mentors, give him the experience of leading younger kids, leading tutoring sessions. And we've slowly seen a transition in his own demeanor of how he carries himself, how he presents himself, how he speaks, how he deals with authority, because for the first time he's actually an authority figure and not just being talked at. Um, and currently, his freshman year, he had a straight D's and F's, but now he has A's and B's, and he's working with us even during the summer, running after or summer programs to really mentor and work with young people 
and talk about his own experiences. So once again, thank you for allowing me to share this opportunity. Um, my goal for tonight was really to tell you guys about Coaching for Change, um, help you guys understand what our mission and what our goals are. And in the next three to five years, I'm hoping we can have a deep impact in Brockton by reaching 300 high school students and roughly about 1,500 elementary and middle school students. And we're also um, working to build a stronger partnership with Bridgewater State. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I mean, what your program is providing kids, I think, is a positive role model and, you know, mentors and, and, and people to respect and aspire to and provide structure to so many kids that don't have structure in their lives. I mean, um, it's huge. So it's, it's certainly um, a noble and uh, beneficial program. Um, any of the um, members, Mrs. Joyce, have some questions or comments? program um, because it's targeting kids that like you said a lot of a lot of our programs write off they give them chance after chance uh, sports programs if you don't have the grades if you have the behavior issues you're out of the sports and it's and it's almost counterproductive in a way um, so I do like that you've identified these students um, and that you're going about it in a different way and, and that I love the mentoring aspect of it as well because uh, it does, especially boys, it does tend to turn them around when, when somebody counts on them, you know, when they can be somebody that's important to somebody else. Um, I'm curious about the, um, the college mentors. Mm -hmm. How does that work? How do you identify the students? Like, my, my son goes to Bridgewater State. If he was interested in being a mentor for this program, what would he need to do? Um, does he have to be in a certain, um, a certain, um, major or, or what is you know what are you looking for so they don't have to be in a specific major but we do target um, criminal justice education and sociology majors mm -hmm. because it allows them to take what they're learning in the classroom and actually applying it in real time so these are actually courses that they take at at the college their uh, their credited courses yes okay so okay. We, we we get our college students from two points of entry one is at actually three points of entry. One is taking a college class. Um, another is joining our club that we that we have, or they join us as an intern, as an internship. And right now we're working with Bridgewater State to build out a fellowship where college students become Coaching for Change fellows. And how does the tutoring work? Where they're helping them, and, and how is the tutoring, tutoring made relevant to what's going on in the classroom? So we have two different cohorts for, for college students. We have our cohort of college students that help develop the leadership program, and then we have a second academic support um, cohort. Mm -hmm. And we specific, once we understand where the students are struggling, we go out and find those, stu those tutors to support them during, the, during their after school program. Okay, and what's the partnership with the administration and the schools? What's that like? For the college well, you, or? You have um, partner sites. So yes. is, there any, um, is there any communication? Is there any um, collaboration with, with the administrators or the teachers or, or staff at those schools? Yes, so we, we hire um, teachers to run the, okay. the actual classes. Mm -hmm. And the administration helps us identify the students that we're working with. Mm -hmm. And they provide us with report cards, transcripts, um, and help us understand the school culture. Okay. Because each school, which I'm learning very quickly, yeah. is very different. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is a great program. And I'd like to see you, I'd like to invite you back. Thank um, you. After you've had a few semesters. And let us know how you're doing and what we can do to support your program. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, Programs yes. So male female mentors, male female student participants? Yes. Excellent. Um, and the high risk students that you described, like the uh, 10 or more missed days, mm -hmm. uh, low academic achievement, you're identifying those high risk students both in the high school level and the middle school level? Pri prior to this semester coming up, we've only done it at the high school level. Okay. But now we're starting to look at the middle school and elementary school level to see how it all plays out because we're starting to realize 
um, after talking to Mr. Cairo from South and Ms. Campbell from um, Davis, they started saying that they saw changes in their students. And we've never thought of it that way. So now we're looking at it more deeply of what does this look like at the lower schools? Okay, so the high school students were the ones being recruited based on risk to mm -hmm. be mentors for middle school kids. Yes. And to be mentored by the college mm -hmm. age students. Correct. Middle school students to this point have just participated based on interest? Yes, yes. And now we're making that shift into... To maybe have kids referred to the program. Exactly. Suggested or strongly encouraged. To yes. Based yes. on some identified need. Yes. Okay. Um, and where is your funding coming from currently? All over the place. Uh, so we write grants. Um, we, I got a fellowship out of New York City um, called Echoing Green. And then we got uh, last year a two-year grant um, from Strategic Grant Partners, uh, which is a philanthropic group yep. out of Boston, yeah. um, and also the DA's office. OK, yeah. County. Department. Yes, yes. And some of it's in kind also from Brockton Public Schools um, with transportation uh, space and space and, and things of that nature, yes. And so the, the college age students and the high school age students are stipend in some way? So the college students normally just get credit. They get the, class credit. Yes. Yeah. The high school students get a stipend of $200 per semester when they, they hit specific goals. Okay. Um, so we have them do weekly check-ins with us that um, look at their grades, uh, their school behavior, um, and attendance. Okay, perfect, thanks. That's all for now. Marquis mentioned uh, the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office, and I think many of you know Ed Jacobs, Brockton High grad, longtime friend and collaborator with the Brockton Public Schools, with our grant writers, uh, has done an excellent job, again, of um, looking at monies that he has available to make sure he supports these kinds of collaborations. And uh, I mentioned to Marquise one of the things that uh, I know he's met with Laurie Silver in our Grants and Development Office, but again, to look at the chamber, which is our businesses, I think sometimes when they see something that's working, that's proven, it's, it's a way for them to support something, and it isn't just giving money you know, to an entity, but actually, you know, I like that you had the breakdown of how much it costs to make a difference in the life of a child. So we hope to be able to get that before uh, the chamber. I think you know that I serve on the board of directors, uh, and I'm hoping to bring Chris Cooney on board to, to talk to Marquise. Uh, I, I actually just witnessed this with our DJ Dream Fund, again, which is just so wonderful to the kids in Brockton. Uh, Angela and Dan Henry did a presentation. Uh, they've got some follow-up meetings from that. So I, I think it, uh, by the same tone, I think this will be something that will be respected with the business community and, and getting some support. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, um, moving on with the superintendent report. Our student representative is not here this evening. I'm not sure if this is because of our change in. We're just looking at each other. I think it's our change in calendar dates. I don't know about everybody out there, but I feel like I've missed a month. Um, you know, it's, it's the change of meetings. Uh, so much has happened. So let me start <coughs> talking about what has happened. And very interesting, when we first started out on January 26th, uh, it's shameful that I remember looking at people and saying, this is a great winter if we can just get to February vacation. And I think the skies opened up. Uh, but, but saying that, one of the things that we did initially, and the district right now is looking at six days missed. And if you think of the kind of winter this has had, that is truly a testament. And we're living right now in what is difficult driving. I think we're all very nervous uh, about the, the sidewalks. And the, I, I have never seen, again, the amounts of snow that we have certainly had this past month, never mind the temperatures that we've dealt with. But that being said, um, what an experience to work. And, and I, I wish the mayor were here. I, I know he's uh, trying to get here. But I have to tell you what an excellent job. The uh, Brockton Emergency Management, I think I'd mentioned it last time we met, but for each of those storms, I did have Mr. Thomas come and pick me up one storm. But you know, we, we made it, we you know, certainly brought our facilities department in. There was collaboration, there was discussion, uh, there was input from parents if we got to a point that there were areas or, or bus stops or if we had to take snow down. 
It obviously has, has not been perfect, but I can't thank enough Larry Rowley, uh, again, his initiation as uh, the director of the DPW. Uh, they have just done a fabulous job. Our custodians out there uh, during storms sometimes to try to stay ahead of it, to make sure that our kids can get back to school. I know many of you looked at those delayed openings, and that was done, again, by virtue of, and we had to explain to people about the three-tiered busing system. But to allow our high school students to be able to get out there with some daylight if they were dealing with difficult situations, I do feel made a difference. We're presently looking at the, the sun rising, and we're fortunate enough this week that we're able to stop back on a regular schedule. I am praying by the time we do daylight savings time on March 8th, where we then lose that hour of daylight, that we're looking at a, a much different situation. So I'm going to ask Mr. Thomas to come up. Um, as we've looked around us with roofs collapsing, with you know all of the things that are happening, um, I just want him to you know certainly you know, speak to the public about some of the things we've been able to do, and if you have questions, uh, we'll certainly open it up to a discussion uh, about where we're headed from here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as the roofs, we've concentrated right from the start on the modulars, which we always have when there's been snow. Obviously, you know they're temporary structures that are beyond their shelf life, so it's important for us to keep those um, free of snow. Um, so basically those, I've, we were, went around to all of them uh, over the vacation, but ever since the first storm, um, we have been clearing the modulars off. So those are pretty, pretty much no snow up there, um, especially with this past Sunday with the decent weather that we had. Um, and the other thing, we had the structural engineer come out um, that we had out in 2011. He evaluated several of our, of our schools back then. Um, in the meantime, since then, we've had some new roofs put on to eight of our schools, which has, has been a big help. Um, and his recommendations have been the same. He came out again last Tuesday. Um, anytime there are any high drifts that are over um, four feet, he recommends that we take those down, uh, which we have done uh, and continue to do. Um, we focused um, on the, the Davis and Raymond. When you get a lot of um, different roof levels, um, those buildings, again, they're not the best design for the Northeast because I think you have six different levels of roofs and that's when you have, um, you know, these kind of hallways on top of the roof that, um, you know, create these high drifts. So uh, we really had to concentrate on taking those down and, um, and the old junior highs uh, have, a, you know, some drift spots that we had to focus on. So, um, and also the play areas in the middle of the um, Angelo, the unknown and the pluff. Uh, again, I, a little bit of a design flaw for the northeast, but uh, they do hold a snow load of 100 pounds per square foot. So um, those were actually sampled and measured, and uh, we were well below the 100 pounds per square foot. And they actually are draining well because they drain actually through the middle of the building through some pipes. So um, you know, right now, again, we're in we're in pretty decent shape, um, barring another foot of snow. Um, but we've st we've you know stayed on top of it, and again, it's um, it's not an exact science because you have to be careful that uh, if there's any skylights up there, you have to be very careful about safety. Uh, I want to thank Ken Thompson and Jamie Domestico and and the entire uh, custodial staff with the craftsmen, the travelers, the outside grounds crew. Um, uh, they have all been up on roofs. They've worked hard on you know, the grounds of the schools and work closely with the DPW to try to make it as best as possible for the 25 locations that we have. And uh, it has not been easy. Um, again, some of our parking lots are not in the best shape because of, we've lost several spaces. Uh, we've tried to move as much snow, and, and Larry Raleigh, like the superintendent has said, uh, has been great in, in providing us with, obviously, you know, we don't have the the big front end load is at our disposal, but you know he has, and he's been very helpful with, um, you know, just helping us out with a lot of situations and, and making roads wider. Um, he's gone out if we've had issues with buses or vans getting down certain streets, side streets. He's tried to go down and make those wider. He really helped us out with Electric Ave going into the Downey. Uh, that was an issue, and it's always been an issue when it snows of being uh, narrow and people can park, park on both sides of the street there. So, again, just a lot of different things and a, just a team effort with the mayor's office, the emergency management team, and then our facility staff with the DPW, and as long as the, and Jimmy Casseri as well with the building department. 
with helping us with the roofs and things have been it's just been a great team effort and it hasn't been easy but uh, the guys have really and ladies have really worked hard and we welcome I mean we we obviously take complaints anytime that people want to call and have concerns and I know any other bus stops that people have issues with um, any of the large bus stops that we have a lot of kids waiting at the DPW has been out and has you know, taken the uh, front end loader to remove some snow so it, you know, there's more room for the, the kids to stand so uh, if there are any uh, spots that people know of we welcome them to call and, and, and let us know uh, we try to get out to as many locations as we can but we have over 175 bus stops throughout the city so uh, and we actually have we can we've moved some we've added some so kids don't have to walk as far um, you know with no sidewalks especially on the side roads so um, we, we do try to make those accommodations and and we ask people to be patient because we know that the buses and vans have been running late uh, the last month because it's just hard for them to navigate around the streets and and they've been late and um, and that's been an issue and we understand that and we work on that every day as well. This week we have talked about uh, cutting, you know, the tardies can wait because obviously it's difficult, you know, managing getting around the city. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the public and to thank the parents most of all because they certainly have come through with doing just as we asked. I've seen parents standing at bus stops with kids, they're walking kids, they are carpooling, and they're pulling together during a time when we needed the most. Um, I will let you know also that we are presently at June 29th, which is the Monday. We have one day left on the calendar. I was in the DESC yesterday and today. I heard loud and clear from the commissioner that 180 days is 180 days. So we are working uh, very closely uh, with our teachers union. We'll continue to have conversation. Um, I'm hoping we don't have to go there, uh, but we will have discussion uh, with the BEA if in fact we run out of our last day, June 30th. Uh, we do have, um, from having worked in the past, there is the possibility uh, of Good Friday, which presently is a day off. Uh, we could look at that as possibly a half a day. So there are some things we've done in the past, but we will, we will work very closely, again, uh, with our teachers unions. And I will tell you this, when I talk about the public, I tried to go to one of the local supermarkets uh, on Saturday. And as I went through the supermarket, there were a number of people that stopped me. These are not people that I know. Uh, but they talked about the situation. Um, most of them were pleased. They, I think they felt bad. <laughs> so it was very interesting. The public is very in tune uh, to what's happening and certainly know that, that you're listening to them and we're doing the best we can to, uh, in, during a very difficult situation. Mr. Henningson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. And thank you for, you know, it, the custodians, everybody's been just absolutely fantastic and <laughs> working to clear the snow. And, and get everything cleared for the students. Um, just for the public, um, could you probably explain the process of clearing snow on sidewalks around the school and what the school is responsible for? Because there seems to be confusion with people on who does what. Yeah, we the custodians are responsible for anything on school grounds, the walkways that come from the street all the way, you know, the, the sidewalks that are on school grounds, the walkways, the stoops, the stairwells, um, all those, that area is, we, we, you know, we do with snow blowers and shovels. Um, we do not have heavy equipment. We have one front end loader uh, that's pretty small that goes out and can take down snow banks and it does a, most of its work up here at the high school. Um, the DPW does plow all of our buildings. Uh, and their practice has been, um, as far as sidewalks, they go pretty much a mile out in each direction from every school. Uh, I think this, this year they've gone a little bit further than that. Um, um, this year they actually have had the sidewalk plows out right away, which was something that um, is, is pretty new this year. Um, they used to wait a while because they had so many people that had a plow, but they have um, dedicated um, some of their staff just to the sidewalk plows and they've been out and thank God because you know they they can move it up to, the sidewalk plows move easily pretty much up to a foot of snow and it gets any higher than that they have a lot of trouble so if they didn't stay on top of the sidewalks uh, there'd be an issue but our custodians cannot go out onto city streets and start 
in clearing snow. We don't have the equipment, number one, and, and uh, it's not our work. Um, so you don't want to run into union issues that way as well. So um, the sidewalks that are on city streets, uh, you know, belong to the D D uh, DPW, which, you know, again, I think they've done a great job. I mean, it's been a difficult situation for them, and, um, and we've tried to help as much as we could. But, you know, our responsibility is the school grounds. And, and I've physically witnessed them in the process of doing, you know, sidewalks in the DPW, and and the, and it's not as easy as people think it is. It's not a snow blower. It's basically just a a, a plow attached to a bobcat. Exactly. And it pushes yep. it, and then a front end loader collects it. Yeah. And it's it's a long involved process to do. You know, 50 feet easily took, oh God, easily 20 minutes, and it took a crew to do that. And exactly. It's, it's not cheap either, but I want no. to also, yes, thank you and, and, and your oh, staff you're for yeah. doing an excellent job. I saw the guys up on the roof at North the other night, so uh, God love them. I, I don't like heights, so I, I <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. What improvement I've seen this year that DPW's been doing, um, which I think is very good common sense, rather than plowing down the middle of the sidewalk, they're working from the street in, which allows the the more of ability of what clearing the street also as well as the sidewalk but then kids and persons working walking up those areas are seen a lot easier because a lot of times when you do in the middle of the sidewalk the kids feel safe running up and down they get to a corner sometimes forget to stop the way they yeah. should because it may be what they consider a secondary or a neighborhood street where is the traffic's a little less but unfortunately and I've been up in Boston and a lot of other places in between there's almost no place that you can stop with you know have to stop at the corner before you pull out and you cannot see cars coming from other ways and um, it's just a very unusual as was stated by the superintendent the amount of snow it's over eight feet of snow we've had in about roughly 20 days with almost no melting yeah. whatsoever so it's been you know very good what's been done yeah and then again in, in a lot of times which they the DPW haven't done they they've actually gone out with the loader following the sidewalks pile and actually taking snow out which they've you know last week they spent a ton of time doing that I mean all over the main streets leading to schools on Plain Street to uh, Warren Ave to Belmont to you know Forest Ave I mean it's you know, to Oak. I mean, they've really worked hard. Pearl. I mean, they were out all over the place because it was not easy getting around the city last week. A lot of streets were blocked <laughs> off, and but that's what they were doing. And you could see the result of it this week when the kids went back to school. So, you know, we it's been a good team effort. It hasn't been easy, but it's been good. The other thing that we're preparing to do is uh, a <coughs> supplemental calendar is going to go out. You know, our calendar we send home at the beginning of the year. A supplemental calendar reflecting the additional days, taking a look at some of the professional development days that we've lost and probably won't regain at this point, the marking periods. So all of that will be given to families reflecting. You know, I, I really don't want to wait. I'd like to get something out there so parents can follow. And if we have to put out another one, we will. So we'll, we'll definitely uh, keep parents informed. I will let you know that the DESE has extended our testing window. I had thought it was going to provide additional days to prepare the students. That's not necessarily the case, but dealing with PARC for the first time and uh, a lot of uh, this is new to our teachers and staff. So by extending that out, it does give us a little bit more of a window during the testing period. Uh, if the district is going to consider half a day on Good Friday, I would suggest that we do that um, sooner rather than later to give people notice so that they can make plans ahead of time because it's only really a month away, a month and a week. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll be seeing uh, Kim Gibson tomorrow evening and we'll okay. uh, plan to talk very, very soon. Uh, the other thing I would just, you know, caution our drivers and the public out there to use due care because as we all know, the snow banks are extremely high and you can't see even backing out of a driveway you cannot back out of a drive you have to crawl out of the driveway because you can't see what's coming and you can't see another car and you can't see a child uh, or a pedestrian so um, you know please use due care and to our students and our school uh, principals and leaders um, you know please periodically remind these students to walk if they're in the street single file because I have witnessed sometimes two and three deep kids 
Um, the cars are extremely annoyed and getting impatient uh, because they're being basically pinched. One day I was driving down one street in Brockton and there were kids on both sides of the street, too deep, the cars were being pinched together going in the opposite direction and when they got around those kids they jammed on the gas because they were so angry that the kids were just causing such a you know a distraction and, and a problem so we need to make sure our students are being smart and using caution as well um, you know and, and we all know what happened in Quincy the poor students slipped on ice and you know got hit by the cab uh, so We've just got to be cautious, you know, in, the, in this unprecedented, crazy uh, weather we're having. So, okay, anything else on this top? Mr. Just, Jordan. May I suggest just one thing? A lot of people seem to back out their driveway, which to me is not common sense. If you can back in your driveway, <laughs> when you're coming out, you see more. You've got double the, the length of your car going out into the street before you can even see what's happening. So if you can take, if it's possible, the back end, when you're coming out, you have a, you'll see it quicker than if you back out. Uh, that's just something I think some people just don't think about. I don't understand it, especially on busy streets. Yeah. You're a very logical person, Mr. Joy. I have to be. So. I have never been so courteous a driver in my life. You're, you're letting everybody, really, it's a different way of driving, letting people out. You're not used to that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder Mr. Thomas needs to drive you around. <laughs> Did you at least buy him a cup of coffee? <laughs> <coughs> next item. <laughs> uh, the next item I'd like to talk about um, is uh, the charter school. Um, I was informed uh, on Friday the 13th, as luck would have it, uh, February 13th, I received a call from the commissioner's office that they were, um, there were six charter applications. Two were the Commonwealth charter applications. He was recommending um, four applications and two of them were not being recommended. One of them not being recommended was the New Heights Charter for Brockton. While I am pleased that that at this time, and that was very, very clear uh, in the rebuttal that was put together by our district, by the concern that we had about the charter at this time. And I spent uh, last night uh, making a, a public statement again before the uh, board, the Board of Education. Um, and also I was there you know, today to listen to the discussion uh, about the charters that were being approved, a discussion about the charters that were not being approved. I will share with you that information that I've received uh, from the department in your packet this week. So you'll see the comments. Um, looking forward, the one thing that I will say, for me this has been truly an education. It's been an education about Horace Mann, Horace Mann III, uh, innovation models, Commonwealth charters, and really the one thing that I can tell you as superintendent is every one of us sitting here, every one of us sitting out there wants the best that we can have for our students so that they can thrive, so that they can be prepared for college and career, and in saying that, one of the things that we will continue to do, and I'm talking actually very quickly, because when you talk about charter applications, the applications are due July 1st again. And the one thing that I'll say out there for people that are looking into what charters are all about, a lot of it is about seat capacity. And Brockton is the, one of the, is the only urban district without a Commonwealth charter in our district. That being said, the thing that most important about our district is we are all about innovation extended learning time schools, looking at a STEM and an arts academy, looking at you know, IB programs. You've done all of this as a district. So we're gonna be looking at innovation. I'm gonna be looking to work very, very closely with the union, talking about Horace Mann, talking about ways. So we become an innovation district. And this is not a place where we need, it's not about a Commonwealth Charter. We need a Commonwealth Charter where we do build bridges where we do perform, you know, work for the uh, best interests of our students and have a say in that. I understand there's a separate uh, board of education, or bo a board of directors, I should say, but also to certainly have some representation if this is something that is good for our students and our community. So it has is truly uh, been an education. I've had conversations uh, yesterday with a number of the board members that wanted to speak to me about the district. Clearly, they were overwhelmed 
by the coming together of the city council, of the legislators, of the mayor, of our school committee, and our community talking about we, what we want in Brockton. So again, uh, I will continue to update you. We're gonna be working uh, with our executive team to talk about what the district looks like. And again, it's, we're already looking at our facilities. We're already looking at our programs. And there are a number of programs that we can look at through uh, a different lens. So I will be coming back and making some recommendations to you in preparation for that July 1st deadline when instead of having Brockton always looking to fight charters, we're going to be there. We're going to be there presenting, working with our grants and development office and talking about you know, what direction we want to go in. I will also tell you uh, the Board of Education today, I had the opportunity where I was actually uh, in Malden last night and this morning. They had a presentation on the breakfast in the classroom. And the Board of Education made a comment that um, they were inviting me to join them because I was there so often over the past couple of months. Um, I was very pleased to talk about the breakfast in the classroom. It's something that the commissioner has just sent a memo out talking about the time and talking about how quickly the breakfast in the classroom takes place. It really doesn't interrupt learning. They're talking about this being in all urban district. The talk today was about mandating breakfast in the classroom for level four and five school districts. So I feel very good about where Brockton is. We continue to bring schools on board. We have two schools that are once again in the planning process. I believe it's the Kennedy and the Raymond School. The Huntington and South, you know, came on just in the past couple of months. My goal district-wide is to bring breakfast in the classroom to our families uh, in the Brockton community. So I was pleased to be there today for that. And to finish up, um, I want to thank our um, Chief Budget Officer, Aldo Petronio, because also when we're out there showing our advocacy, one of the things that we've talked about for a long time with a very, very difficult budget is this uh, foundation, this Chapter 70 Foundation <laughs> Review Commission. Aldo has made sure that he has been throughout the state, and I joined him on the Cape, I believe it was February 7th on Saturday. And it gave me an opportunity pr to present with uh, the CAPE delegation that they had down there. We talked about the inflation factor. Uh, we talked about uh, the enrollment and the October 1st date versus a date later in the year. There was a lot of discussion. That was something that they were very in tune to. They asked if we had put in for the pothole funds account. And of course we had, when the nice 9C cuts came, we were told that money wasn't available. So it felt good to tell them, yes, in fact, we had done that. So we certainly have been positioned well. They're listening to what we had to say. I know I, sub I submitted to you the statement that we actually made uh, at that Chapter 70 hearing. So, so again, Brockton is out there, uh, certainly out in the, you know, in the community with the uh, Department of Ed, with uh, the, certainly that was the legislature, and we're letting them know that we have concerns and are looking for support from them. So we've been, in, in the midst of all this uh, snow and weather, we've been very, very active uh, in certainly getting our message um, across. And I also, in, in talking about budgets and cuts, one of the things that I'd like to do is I'd like to invite uh, Karen uh, Watkins-Watt and Laurie uh, Silva to come down because I want to bring to your attention, there was an article in the newspaper. Um, it took me by surprise in that there were so many other things happening. We had been interviewed, I believe, earlier or in the month or a month or so ago. At least two or three months. So when I saw that 1.7 million, you know, it took me by surprise in thinking there was some new money that had come in. But um, I want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, one thing, I want to thank Karen uh, and, and Peter Caruso, uh, Mary Ellen Karain, uh, and certainly uh, Tom Burke for initially putting together the prospectus on this grant and for bringing this to our city. Uh, Perry Jacobs and Nick Lee who have joined us you know, during the past summer. Um, so I just wanted to clear up a couple of things, Karen. Uh, the date that we actually got the grant, I I'll let you take over, but can you talk a little bit about um, the grant? Oh, sure. Yes, we actually um, submitted the grant um, in April of 2013, actually. So, it, it, um, and expecting to be um, a uh, 2014 grantee. Um, however, we were sort of delayed. They, they were de we were delayed in the process in terms of the, the approvals, and so we received our um, our grant award as of May 1st, 2014. I believe that's the right date. Um, so. Yeah, and, and that there's just been tremendous. I, I brought um, 
a copy of our um, executive summary that we just um, submitted to the Office of Safe and Healthy Students um, that was submitted under uh, Superintendent Smith's authority and Laurie's authority and um, and have made some tremendous progress. If you, if, you, if I may, I, I'll go over some of the key points. Is that all right to do that? Oh, please. Okay. Um, we've, um, with the $1.75 million uh, grant, three-year grant, uh, we've been able to hire seven new licensed physical um, education teachers. Um, uh, and we've also, in terms of staffing, we've also been able to rehire four parent liaisons. Um, because they were being able to help us with family engagement activities that um, um, were written as a part of the grant that um, uh, because of their reduction in force, we would not have been able to carry those out. So we were fortunate enough to be able to, to use the budget through a budget modification that was approved by the, by the department to, um, to be able to do that. Um, and we've had several trainings of the, the, of the new physical education teachers um, um, in the, the, the Presidential Youth Fitness Program, which you probably have all heard of from way back. Um, so that's, um, that's, so training in that. And in uh, software, uh, Fitness Grim software, we've been able to buy to help us track our prog progress. Um, and in, speak in terms of tracking progress, they've actually, because our district is so large, um, they're um, also at, um, allowing us to do what's called random sampling in terms of our data collection process. So we are, um, being able to um, get sort of cohorts of students to um, complete what's called three-day physical activity reports, wear pedometers, and be able to track their physical um, activity. Um, let's see. Um, so like I said, the trainings, uh, we started um, and developed um, some before school activities for three of the seven targeted schools at East, South, and West Middle Schools. And we've been able to renovate some of the existing gymnasiums and uh, equip the facilities with age-appropriate fitness equipment. Um, we've purchased um, the coordinated approach to child health nutrition education curriculum uh, for the, our targeted middle schools and um, been able to train the, C, um, the seven health uh, educators at those schools. Um, we've established an after-school healthy eating program at North Middle School and um, the University of Massachusetts Extension Nutrition Education Program, I say that three times fast, uh -huh. mouthful, uh, has facilitated those nutrition lessons at all seven of the target middle schools. So the, some of the after school program is going to be phased in at the seven schools. They're not all gonna have them in year one. Um, so that's, that's all gonna be phased in. And then we've been able to, um, um, I mentioned restoring the, the, um, the four of the eight parent liaisons and um, we've established a parent engagement schedule um, uh, for uh, the 2014-15 year. And actually, I need to add Jane Faroli was part of our grant writing team as well. And so she's been integral in terms of um, helping us establish those parent engagement activities. Um, we've had a Zumba night at South Middle School. And um, all seven schools, of course, were targeted to participate. And um, the parent liaisons have created class lists for all the students at the target school for communications purposes. And um, we've established resource tables and um, featuring fitness and nutrition information. Karen, the uh, mm -hmm. amount for this year is $579,000 that we exactly. received. Exactly, it is. And we still right. haven't drawn that down completely. Exactly, yet. that's right, that's right, yes. Very good. So, so mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, no, um, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So on uh, a high note, I also wanted to share with you that we did receive notification about 9C cuts. So those are cuts that have come in the middle of the year. Uh, I think they were trying to spare public education as much as they could. Unfortunately, it affected our kindergarten grant. Um, we have every reason to believe we're going to be able to survive this at this point with some of the professional development money, maybe losing some of the materials and supplies we had been prepared to purchase. I actually was with Representative Cronin uh, last night at the Department of Education. She told me that they're still looking at revenues and there's a possibility that some of that would be restored. But at this point, we are prepared for that cut with our MKEA grant. 
and also I have Laurie Silver up here because many of you know the summer of work and learning. I think you've attended the luncheon. You've seen what that has done over 20 plus 20, years, 21 years for the yep. students in the district. So Laurie, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, through the 9C cuts, and, and I can understand the reasoning of why the governor did this, um, basically he uh, withdrew any summer program funding um, that he felt was appropriate. So with that being said, for Brockton, the Summer of Work and Learning uh, program was uh, eliminated. Um, as well as most of you are aware of, we for two, uh, two years, or three years in a row, ran the Summer Seat program, which was the bilingual program for middle and high school. We've continually been running the Summer Cell program, which was the elementary model of the bilingual um, summer academic support services. Over the last few years, we were able to implement a similar model, but for the middle and high school um, students. So we were servicing about 200 some odd students with, with those um, monies. Unfortunately, that program um, had its funding cut as well. So we can, the way the summer of work and learning was built in, we can run some sort of a hybrid model of that, which I'm very well, ple I'm pleased that we can at least do that. We'll have some semblance of a program. Because basically the way that grant was written and the way the, the state allowed those funds to be utilized, we could only um, pay staff with that grant money, not student wages. So we've always been very creative about how we've been able to fund student wages. So I'm left with looking at shrinking down the program model, have less students um, being being needed to be paid, and have less staff that need to be covered through other funding resources in order to maintain a model. After 21 years in the city, we can't let that program just totally go away. Um, it would be a great disservice to not only the students and, and, and the families that get affected by it, but by the community at large, because that's one of the, the best venues for us in the summertime to have a presence in the community and to really show the community how Brockton High School students can shine. So we'll definitely move forward on that. Um, the SEAT program, however, um, I do not see um, in the foreseeable future how we could probably capitalize on other funding streams to to um, have that still be a viable program for this summer. We are um, uh, pursuing other grants. Um, we have quite a few grants that we're pursuing, but they don't actually um, work towards uh, maintaining that model. Um, we're working on, um, Karen and, and a, a large part of her team too have been working on the, the food ex expansion programs. Um, we're looking at a STEM uh, grant for up the high school here through Motorola. Um, 21st Century uh, program is coming out with some more funding. Uh, we recently received 30,000 additional dollars to work with for uh, pulling in more youth with disabilities in our existing program. Um, they're releasing um, an extended learning time grant opportunity and also an out of school and after school um, time um, opportunity which we will also be, be pursuing both of those. We will be meeting with the leadership team to help decide which schools we'll be um, highlighting to um, write for those proposals. We um, also have, there's an Artworks grant that we're looking at um, to help um, East with some of their initiatives that they're going on. Um, and there's a, 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 a new co uh, coalition um, building on what works that um, we're watching closely. They have a $75 million fund that they're going to be making available in the near future to work with high needs communities, which Brockton would definitely be one. Um, and they're basically targeting their resources on three target areas is early learning investments, extended learning time, or redesign and innovation school models. So we'll be watching that closely to see not only um, what they're looking at as far as what they're willing to fund within those three foci areas, but also what are they looking at um, for allocations for each community. Um, and then lastly, um, Ethan, thank you for passing this information on, but we're, we're looking at researching um, interest-free loans for capital projects, um, which was a resource that he recently came, came across. So um, we're actively pursuing other funding resources, and at the same time, we are still, um, we're building the development part of the office. Um, we have some community um, business organizations that have already agreed to come to this table and start working with us on strategic, some 
some strategic plans on how to move that forward um, and how to help us build that mission and vision to move the district forward. Anyone have any? Mr. Jordan? Yeah, I have a question for Karen. You mm -hmm. mentioned that you had equipment that uh, was bought by the grant, I guess, to be used. Is it only for children within that being covered by the grant or is that for the whole school? Well actually the whole school does get to benefit <laughs> um, okay. and the, 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 the physical education teacher that's been hired by the, uh, the PEP grant as well as the regular physical education teacher are working together in uh, collaboration with uh, using that equipment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The grant was a wonderful team effort. Karen pulled a lot of people together. <laughs> <laughs> it is a team. It is teamwork. It was teamwork. Mm -hmm. That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Laurie, before mm -hmm. I let you go, since you're the, on the next uh, agenda item, yes, um, I do want to also mention while we're talking about grants, you approved a grant here uh, to submit for adult basic education grant proposal. It was an additional, I think, sixty thousand dollars. But it allows me to introduce you to our new coordinator for the uh, adult. Uh, Learning Center, uh, Kathleen Quinn is taking over for Suzanne Martin. I am so pleased that she has been uh, chosen. Uh, Kathy has been with us since 1984, been part of our Adult Learning Center. She has served uh, under Suzanne's tutelage uh, as an assistant supervisor. She will bring a wealth of information. She's been an author on a number of uh, programs that are used widely in the world uh, of adult education. So please join me in welcoming uh, Kathleen Quinn as our new coordinator. And at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Jane Rizzitano to also join us with Laurie Silva in talking about uh, investing in uh, China relations for our students. And I will make a note that we did have on the agenda to talk about um, some scholarship opportunities for Brockton High students. Uh, Principal Wolder and uh, Associate Principal uh, Perkins are at the playoffs for, I believe, boys basketball and girls basketball. MIAA rules require that they attend the first night of the playoffs. So they'll be back. We'll have that on uh, another night, another agenda item. So need us to move? <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for having me. Um, I am the coordinator of foreign languages, and several years ago we started a Chinese program at Cliff Academy which at the time was the Gilmore School. So I believe you had time to read the proposal in your packets. Um, one of the extensions of the learning of the Chinese program that we would like to do now is to actually get our students to China. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who speak another language, you know how important it is to actually be able to immerse into another culture mm -hmm. so that you not only are learning more of the nuances of the language but you're also learning the kinds of cultural traditions that are very important that bridge um, culture to culture, that build linguistic bridges, etc. So we have been working with um, Primary Source um, who even though we are not partnering with them anymore they have they still continue to help me and um, I go and present for them whenever they need me to. Um, and also with the 100,000 strong people who are willing to come and help us make some uh, connections in order to get scholarship money. What we would like to do is to identify 10 to 12 students through a rigorous application process and be able to provide them with monies to actually spend about two weeks in China, including a couple of nights of homestay, so that this is not, you know, a trip that's just a vacation where they're going to go sightseeing. They, they need to go and actually live a couple of days with a Chinese family, speak Chinese on their own without their teacher coaching them, um, and see how they, how they do. Um, so in order to do this, we would like to solicit within the community, some of our community partners, individual scholarships um, for between four and $5,000. Um, I would like to see the students pay for part of it. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe $500 of their con contribution would be 
appropriate because I think that um, it, it's it's um, important for them to invest in their own future as well. Um, and you know they would be able to see some of the major cities in China with Beijing. Um, I think a homestay in Xi'an would be nice. That's a smaller city. And then to finish up in Shanghai. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the foreign language field, you know, global competence is really a very important um, skill for our students to have. You know, uh, in terms of our economic, strategic, um, our defense, you know, we are intricately involved and intimately involved with China, and we will be for many years. Um, and I think that the more that we can reach out a hand and understand the Chinese and help them understand us, right now they understand us a lot better than we understand them. Um, I think it's only going to help us in terms of uh, our economy and our defense systems and our, uh, you know, socioeconomic process better. Um, so at this point, I'm looking into some of the travel companies. I have not um, made any specific calls yet because I, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. I just wanted to give you an idea of where we were at um, and uh, open it up to any questions. And also, if Laurie, I don't know if you want to add some things there. Sure, I was um, very excited when Jane came to me with this proposal and, and asked if I would, you know, help help her on, on some of this initiative. And, and um, one of the, the the areas that I really saw a, a, a wonderful fit is this really does enter in the realm of our development office, how we're trying to broker into development. So Jane and I did a, a, a pilot, um, and we had a few business people come in one day for a lovely presentation, which some of it um, Jane will be showing you tonight. Um, but we were very strategic and very specific about who we asked to the table. There were companies that have relations with China. Mm -hmm. So it was a very targeted hit as far as asking them to come to the table and asking them for how we could make this partnership work well for them. How would you like to see if we could may have a pipeline for maybe in, uh, you know, Chinese speaking students who go to college then come back and work for your company and, and are able to speak the language of the companies that you actually do a lot of your businesses with. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, it was very um, insightful as far as they were very excited about this prospect as well. So it's something, um, again, we didn't want to um, broaden the scope too much and expect. Ex expand too many activities until we have time to come and present to you, feel your questions, um, and have discussions with you in, in, um, before we moved it forward. Okay, I have a short video that I'd like to show you, um, unless you'd like to ask some questions first and then I can show you that. It's up to you. you said, well, get it on student that their family didn't, uh, doesn't have the resources, the $500, are there any provisions that you've thought of maybe to uh, help that student along? Um, we have not um, gotten quite that far, but I think that we, in discussions with Ms. Walder and Mr. Perkins as well, and also with Ms. Nezrella, we all feel very strongly that that should not prohibit a mm -hmm. student from going on this trip if the trip is approved. Just something else, two airlines, now have nonstop from Boston into China. One is just opening up, so you may want to talk to those folks. They may be yep. uh, interested in doing something for children at this point. Thank you. Video, and then maybe after that, people might have okay. some yeah. questions. Um, let me see if I can. Okay. So this is a student who graduated a year ago. And he is actually Skyping with Ren Li, who is our Chinese teacher at IB Chinese teacher. He is Skyping with her mother-in-law in China. Let me see if I can bring this up. Um, whoop. Cheryl, can you help me with the sound? Sure why that's not coming. We need to move this on here. 
go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, for those of you who, you, you may know this, but um, English and the Romance languages are considered category one languages. So they're a little bit easier to learn because they, the system, the vocabulary and structural systems are close to our own. Um, Chinese is ca what's called a category four language. It takes longer to learn. It's a little more difficult. It's tonal. Um, and the writing system is different. So they start by writing, you know, characters, and each character has semantic meaning as well as um, uh, grammatical meaning. Although the, the grammar in Chinese, my understanding is that it's rather uh, easy compared to, um, you know, some of the Romance languages and the Germanic languages. So um, it's very impressive when you hear a kid after four or five years speaking that fluently. Um, it's and it's a credit to our program and the teachers that we have in the program that really push the kids to get them to do that so anyhow um, I've put some information up here about why China is so important um, and I'd like to just open it up to any questions that you may have for us uh, I, would, I, mean, I would encourage you to um, do your due diligence and to go forward with um, you know, an outline that you'd like to follow. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we want to explore, you know, the safety issue and the safety aspect mm -hmm. of this, you know, our students living with the families and um, how those families are um, chosen and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, so, so we're going to obviously have safety concerns. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, this, this is obviously a, a unique opportunity and, and I certainly wouldn't want to discourage um, 
you know, an opportunity for some of our students that really mm -hmm. are advanced and could benefit and, uh, you know, provide them with an op a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but again, you know, safety issues and aspects are going to be, you know, for, uh, at the forefront for all of us on the school committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I, can al I already can hear Mrs. Joyce in my head with uh, all of her <laughs> questions. Um, um, China, but, but, but China, rightly so. China, and, interestingly enough, does not have a lot of violent crime. Um, it's more like some of the European cities where there's some pickpocketing pick things like that. You don't want them to get like run that. over by a rickshaw either, you know. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Driving is frightening in China <laughs> sometimes. Um, but we, um, you know, the chaperones that would go would be two of the native speaking Chinese teachers. And I have also um, asked one of our nurses, Sarah Kelly, who teaches in the nursing program here and who ho has hosted many of our Chinese exchange teachers, um, if she would be willing to go as a chaperone as well so that there would be a nurse who could uh, participate. So. There are a lot, you're correct though, Mr. Minutello. Those, there are a lot of safeguards that need to be um, right. you know, looked at um, and reviewed and reflected upon prior to you know, us be, even being comfortable in asking for, for approval to, to, for this to be um, you know, implemented you know, fully. But um, those safeguards would, would definitely be um, fine-tuned and, and, and created within the, the confines of the proposal, the final proposal. So pers um, personally, just speaking for myself, you know, I, I would encourage you to, you know, do the exploratory on it, and certainly come back to us, mm -hmm. and you know, present later on. I mean, this is obviously something that I think is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. This is Joyce. Uh, I realize that you're early in the process, but one of the things that kind of um, got my attention was the chaperones. So. If I'm doing the math right, you've got one chaperone for every five students, and so you've got two Chinese students and the coordinator of foreign languages if necessary. Mm -hmm. So that would max you out at 15 students? We're, we are thinking, and depending on what we can get for funding, so we are thinking 10 to 12, uh, up to 15 students. I don't want to take too many more than that. Um, I myself have taken students to Spain, Venezuela, Italy. Um, I have gone for a two-week period. I have gone with students for a two-month period with homestays um, in a variety of different countries. So I yeah. think with high school students who may have, it may be their first time mm -hmm. out of the country in, and even for our students who speak another language at home, um, if they are out of the safety zone of being in a familiar culture, um, this is, a, it will be a, a little bit of a difficult trip because China is very, very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's wonderful. People are unbelievably friendly. Um, I never felt unsafe there when I was there, but it is, you know, um, one of the, one of the biggest safety concerns, and I, I think that you um, sort of alluded to this, Mr. Minicello, is that um, we need to prepare students to travel. So mm -hmm. part of this program would involve significant um, after school time, preparatory time, because students have to understand how you cross cultures, because uh, they do get a little bit of culture shock, and that kicks in. Even the most sophisticated travelers will feel that. So, okay. but you that know, we really want to prepare. My question, <laughs> my question um, centered around. Uh, you had talked about the trip would include a home visit, mm -hmm. uh, a home stay, and you're talking about the, the trip would take place the week before April vacation plus April vacation or immediately after the school year gets out. Mm -hmm. If the trip takes place during the week before April vacation or surrounding April vacation, how do you, how do you staff those classrooms where the teachers are going to China? What about the rest of the students in the in the classes. Right, we, we would have to figure out a way to get subs in for them. Ideally, I would rather have the students go in the summer, mm -hmm. um, but depending on which travel program we, we may travel with, then you know, we I need to be a little bit about flexible. Taking teachers out of classrooms to mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. on a trip for just a few students like that mm -hmm. and disrupting the classroom for that mm -hmm. type of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I would have a problem with that sure. personally. Um, and also, if they have a home stay with a family, 
Are all of the students staying in one home or are they scattered among no, they would, various homes? they would be among various homes. Okay, so they're obviously not being chaperoned when they're in those home stays. Correct. Because you only have one Not directly for, chaperoned. Okay. But so I, those I am, are things I think need to be vetted mm -hmm, out as we mm -hmm. go through the process Absolutely. and those are some of the concerns I right. have. So you would want to know exactly how the families are chosen, for example? Precisely. For the oh, homestays? Right. Well, I think that that would have to be part yeah. of it, yeah. yeah. Because that yeah. we wouldn't be choosing the families, obviously. That would be the corresponding yeah. um, you even kind of alluded office to in it China. Yourself when you said that it's such a different culture yeah. and it is difficult, uh, the students can, the, the young adults or children can mm -hmm. feel very isolated. Um, mm -hmm. That I think that chaperone being readily available is very critical. Absolutely. If they're yeah. alone. I mean, I know that there are a lot of students that go on, you know, um, will spend, what do they call them? The, um, yeah, they go, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. and they'll live in, with in a college, family, yep. a host family, but yep. it's really not school sponsored. It's kind of right. an individual right. decision mm -hmm. that's made with the family. So, um, but I think it's worth you know, exploring, mm -hmm. but I think you have a road to go down. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yep, we're at just at the beginning of this. Yeah, yep. okay. And safety will be a huge factor. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your presentation, though. Oh, thanks. One of my basic statements is things like this. Somewhere in this country, there are numbers of schools that have done this. Part of that is just finding out where they are, what did they do at various levels. Um, you also have a number of departments to do this very well federal departments, if nothing else, state, DOD, you can pick any one of them, uh, who constantly are doing this back and forth and know how and what and how to mm -hmm. present within a couple of days, what do you do when you go in a country, what's positive mm -hmm. and negative, the pros and cons, all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So it's not like you have to recreate the wheel, it's just finding where the wheel is and grabbing that material right. and work with right. it. Um, I you have still have time to do that because yeah. it's not like it's brand new. The, like I said, it's been going on for years, right. exchange students, as mm -hmm. you said, you've participated. And I've done it. I have gone as a 16-year-old. I went and lived in Mexico as an exchange student myself, and I've also taken students on these exchanges probably 15 or 16 times. Um, I do have contacts with many other of the foreign language department heads in the state. I do know who has, um, who, which, um, districts have exchanges so I have um, a lot of good people to advise me right at my fingertips there. Um, I'm also now the past president of the Mass Foreign Language Association as of this year so I have contacts through MAFLA in, as well so that um, you know we would not do this without really having every step worked out very precisely. So You also have the other 49 states that have a similar thing. So. Yes, yes. Mr. Henningsen. Just real quick. Um, so, back on what Mrs. Joyce was saying, obviously security is a concern, but one of the other concerns that I would have is if we, if the students don't do this during the summertime and it's the week before April vacation and April vacation, for example, mm -hmm. that um, I'd like to see how they're going to handle their other curriculum mm -hmm. um, during the, the school day and to make sure yeah. that, that yeah. you know, that gets taken care of. Mm -hmm. I, ideally, we would like this trip to happen in June. Um, the I think one of the reasons why we even put April as a possibility was the fact that many students work during the summer and they may need to earn that money. So that was that was really the consideration why we did that. Thank you. Said that. So. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And uh, the last part of my report of the uh, superintendent of schools, uh, again, keeping on the front burner. Today, uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry and her team spent three hours. I was coming in from the DESE, and they had spent three hours, again, working on the strategic plan. Corey Sullivan came out from uh, EDI. Uh, they talked uh, about prioritizing action steps within the strategies, the strategy owners, making sure we have the right people uh, working on our district improvement plan and owning these strategies. So we'll probably be prepared at our next school committee meeting to really give you an update as to where we are uh, on developing the strategic plan. So, and that's it. 
Um, just going back, um, because you moved so quickly with respect to the charter school, I would like to also thank um, the parents and the students and our um, staff members who so passionately and thoughtfully spoke on behalf of the district. I mean, the public officials aren't the only ones that advocated for this uh, district. So um, we had some very well-spoken students and, and parents and, and certainly teachers that uh, um, brought a perspective that I think uh, opened the eyes of many people. So I just would like to thank all those people who uh, uh, spoke on behalf of the district. Um, we also have, uh, we don't have anything under unfinished business, do we? No? Okay, we'll go to new business. Um, under new business, there was a meeting this evening, a subcommittee meeting of the uh, facilities usage and planning. We had um, a, a very uh, generous and uh, insightful presentation from Save Our Sports. They um, presented to uh, Mr. Jordan and Mrs. Joyce. That meeting took place at 6 o'clock. And um, they are proposing to build a dugout for the girls' softball field. That is the field closest to the gym and the pool. And um, they would bear the entire expense out of their budget. Um, Save Our Sports, as we all know, has done uh, great things for the Brockton community and the Brockton Public Schools. So they are proposing to uh, build that dugout. And, they would work with um, Mr. Lewis, who's the coach of the softball team, Mr. Caruso, who is the athletic director, and obviously Mr. Thomas and Mr. Thompson um, in terms of logistics and timing, because we certainly wouldn't want anything to interfere with the girls' season. And looking at uh, the field with uh, four feet of snow, who knows when construction could take place. So that was one part of the presentation. And um, then we also had Mr. Thomas and um, Mr. Uh, Petronio talk to us about the Barrett Russell Kindergarten and uh, proposing to um, utilize that building as a neighborhood school, a neighborhood kindergarten um, for next year's uh, registration. But the registration will be taking place when would that be taking place? Um, the registration this, is this spring, right? At our kindergarten, yeah. it's taking place now. Our okay. window started, I think, two weeks ago. So there was discussion about using that as a um, local, uh, as a uh, neighborhood kindergarten because there is enough uh, there are enough students in the neighborhoods to support it, and also utilizing that as an overflow. So that is the report of the facilities usage and planning subcommittee. So. Um, a motion to approve the report. So okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Second part of that is that um, the school committee would need to ratify to move forward both items. Um, so I would present uh, a motion to accept the Save Our Sports Organization um, offer of constructing a dugout for the girls softball team. Um, any um, comments or discussion on that? Okay, this is Joyce. Noted that it was moved favorably by the subcommittee. Thank you, Mrs. Joyce. You're welcome, Mr. Minichello. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, certainly, like we said, they've been a great organization. They contributed this year to uh, help us with respect to some intramural programs. They uh, always come through with equipment, and um, this is obviously a generous offer. It's, uh, it's going to cost the organization uh, a little over $16,000, so it's a $16,000 investment, and uh, it would um, really make the field look uh, professional and, and uh, similar to some of the more uh, advanced uh, softball fields in the in in the area where the girls the ladies compete um, at other schools they have these softball uh, dugouts and you know it also provides safety and security you know in clement weather it gives them shade it also prevents uh, you know sometimes foul balls from um, uh, causing harm so uh, there really isn't a downside to it so um, um, as Mrs. Joyce pointed out, the subcommittee voted in favor of that, and we're looking for 
ratification uh, of that motion to accept the Save Our Sports dugout uh, um, construction uh, donation. So I'd make the motion to accept their donation. Okay. Kind of long-winded, wasn't it? So, okay. Um, any further discussion on it? Uh, all in favor? <laughs> okay. My cold is getting the better of me. Um, I know, I sound awful. So, okay, the second thing we would need to do um, in order to go forward um, with the current registrations for kindergarten uh, on the Barrett Russell is to vote in favor again, as Mrs. Joyce pointed out with respect to the dugouts. The um, subcommittee voted in favor of making that Barrett Russell School a neighborhood school in light of the fact that there is certainly enough uh, students to support that in the neighborhood. It also cuts down on busing, um, which is obviously a concern to all of us. So um, um, would present a motion to designate the Barrett Russell as a neighborhood kindergarten for uh, fiscal 2016 registration, as well as an overflow for um, uh, late registrants um, who may need to go there. We would open it up certainly to the neighborhood as part of choice, and then if we had room there with our overflow, they would go to the Barrett Russell. So I make that motion. Would anyone second it? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Great, okay. Anything else under new business? Can we get back to items to refer to subcommittee? I missed it because it's really rescheduling. Okay. What would you like to discuss? Well, we had the curriculum subcommittee. Uh, I'd like to uh, propose that um, we do the special education presentation on March 17th at 6.30 p.m. And that's our regular school committee meeting that evening. And the uh, Tuesday before March 10th at 6 p.m., one of the, uh, the policy responsible use that we're trying to uh, develop, uh, we'd like to bring that forward on March 10th at 6 p.m. And it need be, could you pencil in, um, I will have the mid-cycle review to you on March 10th if there needs to be any discussion at 6.45 p.m. So those are really rescheduling a number of the meetings we had uh, missed because of the snow. Okay, great. Ah, uh, yes, okay. I got a phone call last week from Mr. John Marion, who we all know, basically wanting to let us know that there's going to be a winter celebration, a winter gala over at the um, War Memorial. If you haven't seen the War Memorial building, I mean, it's gorgeous inside, um, very historic, and uh, they did a great job in there. So this Saturday evening at 6 o'clock, 6 to 11, it's going to be, he assures me that it's going to be a very well catered affair. Um, JJ's uh, Cafe is going to be catering it. He says the food will be impressive. Um, and John likes good food, so I'm sure that is true. Um, more importantly, there is also going to be a, um, an award given to uh, everyone's friend, Claire Appling, who's done a lot for this um, city and just obviously gives of herself. So um, she will be presented with the fifth annual Good Samaritan Medical Center James Edgar Community Service Award. So um, tickets are available. Uh, through the Downtown Business Persons Association, and you can get them um, over at John and uh, Paul Marion's shop. They are $50 a ticket, um, and um, uh, again, it should be a really fun time. Uh, if you want to get out, <laughs> get out of the house and go, uh, contact John. He will provide you with tickets, and uh, he also was offering a tuxedo deal. Um, uh, so you may want to talk to him about that as well. Um, so I would encourage people to attend, um, especially people who uh, know Dr. Appling and uh, uh, she was my housemaster uh, and I will be there to see her and see her get this well-deserved award. So You called it a winter celebration. 
It's a winter's end celebration. Oh, oh pardon We're me. We're not celebrating winter anymore. Now you, see, now you see, what you just did was you just cursed us again, saying that it's the end, okay? <laughs> You, you just, you, we're going to get another storm because of you. <laughs> we are tonight. So, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Thomas and I are I already got the text from my son wondering if there's school tomorrow. There is. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell him, no, no go. So, uh, all right. So, does anyone else have any new business, any other items that they would like to talk about? Mr. Henningsen. Just real quick. So on March 7th, I'll be attending, the, for the second year in a row, uh, the Visions of Community um, Conference. It's the Federation of Children uh, with Special Needs. It's, a, it's an absolute fantastic conference. Um, you can still register. I believe it's $75 for the conference all day. It's, it's got Where breakout it? sessions. It's it? in downtown Boston at the Seaport World Trade Center, um, 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and it, it, it was a great conference to attend last year. Um, you learn a lot about um, various issues in the special needs community, um, legislation that's coming up, rules, regulations, um, and they also have a lot of vendors uh, there that present um, their products and services, et cetera. So it, it's a great time. I would encourage anybody if they have a chance to, to attend. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? No? This was a long one. Okay. Um, entertain a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Sorry. All right. So moved. All in favor?